And next November, now you can say you heard it here first, this team will be a serious threat for the 1996 NASCAR Winston Cup Championship. This is Atlanta Motor Speedway, scene of the 1996 NASCAR Winston Cup Championship Showdown. A spectacular ending to a truly amazing year. Hello everyone, I'm Dave Despain. Welcome to the McDonald's NASCAR Winston Cup Rearview Mirror. Rearview Mirror, a look back at the season, get it? And joining me for all the fun is Benny Parsons. Benny, what an amazing year and what an amazing finale. Dave, any time you come to Atlanta with three guys, a chance to win that NASCAR Winston Cup Championship worth a million and a half dollars to the winner and about $480,000 to the second place car, you know it's going to be excited, and it was. We're going to take a look at all of the highlights and a few of the lowlights of the 96 season in our rear view mirror. But most importantly, we're going to hear from the heroes, the men who make Winston Cup racing what TV Guide accurately called the hottest sport in America. There's a lot to like in stock car racing. Neat looking cars that go fast, sound great, and are as safe as anything in motorsports. They're drivers as colorful as the paint jobs. The man in black, Wonder Boy, DJ, the Iceman. Eight months ago, these four and a half dozen more were legitimate title contenders. Over nine months and 31 races, they all stepped up and took their shot. Dale Jarrett claimed the big wins and the big checks with breathtaking regularity. When it was time to race for the biggest check of all, bad luck spoiled his million-dollar dream, but his idol hopes survived all the way to the finale. Dale Earnhardt was his intimidating old self early in the season, a candidate for the unprecedented eighth championship. Then came a single grinding moment of devastation and pain at Talladega. The car, a write-off, Earnhardt's fractures would heal, but in retrospect, the truth is clear. Earnhardt's chances for the 96 title were damaged beyond repair. And in the end, there were two. There is a lot to like in stock car racing. What better than a battle between teammates? As different as night and day, and yet in many ways identical. Determined, focused, breathtakingly talented. Each looking for his second championship. The one that proved the first was no fluke. Each is backed by his personal cog in a powerful wheel called Hendrick Motorsports by a team that will do whatever it takes to keep their guy out front to give their guy a shot at the title. Jeff Gordon's Atlanta finale was a microcosm of his amazing season, battling back from two laps down to keep his title hopes alive. But in the end, Kerry Labonte was his old self, calm, cool, collected, despite the pain of a broken hand. He drove a no must, no fuss kind of race to fifth and put the title on ice. He was close right down to the wire, with Labonte only topping teammate Gordon by 37. Jarrett finished 89 points out of the top spot. Earnhardt was fourth, didn't get that eighth championship, 330 points back. Mark Martin only 49 behind Earnhardt in fifth, and that's without a win this season. Second five has Ricky Rudd in sixth. Despite five victories, Rusty Wallace settles for seventh. Sterling Marlin, a disappointing eighth compared to what he did last year. Bobby Hamilton with a strong finish in his first victory moves into the top ten. And Ernie Urban won two races to take the tenth spot. You take a look at the rest of the top 25. We will take a commercial break. McDonald's 1996 NASCAR Winston Cup rearview mirror is presented by McDonald's. On the track and in our restaurants, just watch us cook. It wasn't close. I mean, he took there off of me, then he hit me. It wasn't close at all. Like I was telling them, you know, I hadn't won seven championships. I hadn't won my first race. I hadn't won 84 or 85 race, whatever he's won. But I'm smart enough to know you don't do that to start the season because there's too many races left. Well, Alaria costed me. So uh, I have a real problem with that. I have a problem with Ernie Irvin and that whole bunch. You know, I've, evidently, it wasn't my fault on that deal. He drove up into me, and he wrecked himself. You know, then he had the dash to come over here and accost me. You know, I'm not happy with it, and I'm going to talk with NASCAR about it. You know, he's just lucky I didn't knock him on his butt. You know, you can always count on Dale Jarrett for a good quote. And the other thing you could count on from the 88 car this year was 
that team would find its way to the pay window. Amazing for a first-year outfit. You know, you would expect a, a first-year team to have problems with consistency, but you really didn't expect them to rise to the occasion on those big races like they did. If it paid a lot of money, trust me, Dale Jarrett and that crew was going to be there. Indeed, they won the three richest races of the year. Let's take an opportunity to look into the rearview mirror with Dale Jarrett. Did you expect this new team to have anything approaching that kind of success? <laughs> I don't think even uh, as big optimist as I am that I could have expected something like this. Uh, you, know, you put together a group of guys that had never worked together before. The only two people on our team that had ever worked together were Todd and Brad Parrott, who are brothers. And uh, Todd had never been a crew chief before. What about Todd Parrott? I mean, it's, maybe it's that second generation thing, but I mean, how does a guy get that good at what he does that quick? I mean, that's pretty good performance. For yeah, definitely. Uh, I, I think that what, the best thing I can say about Todd is he's worked around good people and he's paid attention well. And he's a very sharp individual to begin with. And, you know, working with his dad for a number of years uh, helped him a lot. He understands race procedure. And uh, we just were fortunate to pick Todd up at a time that he was ready to be a crew chief. Not everyone believed that, but uh, we believed that, that he was ready and, and would definitely pay dividends down the road. But uh, he paid big dividends right from the very start. Is there a, one of those, oh, man, moments somewhere in that, in that 31 races, <laughs> a moment that you'd like to have back that you could do again? I said it at the very time that it happened. Uh, at Watkins Glen, we'd had a, just an awesome day because everybody expected us not to run well there. We qualified second, ran in the top three all day. And because some people took on just two tires, we were battling Earnhardt for fifth place and with about four laps to go. And I got to the inside of it going into one and hit the curb and bounced into him and it cut the left front tire down. And I went from finishing fifth or sixth to finishing 24th. And that was about 65 points that we lost. So, you know, if I have to say that, you know, I look back, but there's a number of things that you can look back on. I mean, we had a bolt to break on the, the front of the crankshaft at, at Pocono, and that, that just doesn't happen. So there's a lot of things, but all we can do is learn from them. It's not that we regret doing any of it. You took a heck of a career gamble. You were with a pretty high-profile team that helped you win Daytona the first time, came over here to Yates Racing. There was all the uncertainty about Ernie. The long-term prospects there looked like they might be a little shaky. What did you see there that led you to make that well, I think that what I wanted to do was see how a, a real championship team was run, uh, the opportunity to work with a group of people that had been there and, and done that. And, uh, you know, they hadn't won a championship, but they've been through that. What it really takes, because I was looking at my own organization, I wanted to see exactly what it took and, and see, you know, Dale Jarrett had never been in that quality of a car either. And if I was in that, could I do the job? Could I get it done? Obviously, a lot of people in 1995 didn't much think so, but I certainly believed it that, you know, with the right people and the, and the right setups, uh, uh, I could certainly do it. So that's what I was going on. And, you know, security, yeah, that, that's good. But putting yourself in the right position and getting with the right people uh, is more important to me. And, and I've said it a number of times. I think Keith Oldman on Sports Center. Uh, says it best that uh, talking about players that are day-to-day -day, he said but then again aren't we all and that's the way that I looked at it that you know why plan for the future because we don't know what the future really holds so let's get in the best situation we can for the time you've got this year of experience under your belt you and this and this team what are you going to do in 1997 that maybe you didn't do in 96 or couldn't do in 96 that'll get you the big prize win you the championship I think that uh, we learned a lot about racing for a championship that you have to start at Daytona thinking about a championship. You have to start right then with calls. You know, even though we won Daytona and, and ran well the first couple of races, so that didn't factor in there until we got to Darlington and we had a chance to try to win the race or run out of gas, and we chose to run out of gas uh, trying to win the race. And if we would have come in, we could have probably finished sixth or seventh, and we ended up finishing 15th. So there's a lesson learned. You have to be racing for a championship every single race. You can't, you, you put yourself in a position to win, but that doesn't always happen that you can win. So you have to get the most points that you possibly can that day. And one thing we didn't talk about was Dale Jarrett's injuries. A great season despite being injured. He had a broken leg and a couple of cracked ribs. Nonetheless, held on to be a title contender to the end. Wrecking is part of racing, unfortunately. One of those lowlights we talked about at the top of the show. We'll take a look at the worst crashes of 96 when the McDonald's NASCAR Winston Cup rearview mirror continues. 
Winston Cup cars are famous for protecting their drivers, and it's a good thing because they insist on frequently testing their crash resistance. Kyle Petty's cut tire at Indy led to a series of bone-breaking impacts, cracked ribs, and several weeks out of the cockpit. Bill Elliott says it wasn't the hang time at Talladega, it was that landing. Full force on the left side, the frame rail pressed into the femur, which broke. Awesome Bill, two months on the sidelines. Talladega, notorious for multi-car crashes. Is there anything that hasn't already been said about this one? The off-replayed May melee, in which Ricky Craven's car was beaten and battered from every possible angle, but the all-important driver enclosure protected its occupant. And then there was Dale Earnhardt's Talladega disaster. In light of the potential cost of a crash like this, I guess a broken collarbone and sternum is a small price to pay. Earnhardt has spent his career developing a reputation as a tough guy. He lived up to his billing by walking away from the battered remains of the good wrench Chevy and then built on that reputation with an Iron Man effort in the weeks that followed. Benny, even his harshest critics have got to be impressed with what Earnhardt did after Talladega. They, and folks, if you got any questions about Dale Earnhardt being a racer, he certainly answered those at the Brickyard. Having to get out of that car, and we just saw the emotion, how he hated to get out of that race car and turn it over to Mike Skinner. And then the next week at Watkins Glen, how about that, folks? Broken breastbone, collarbone, road course where you go to right and left, shift gears. He qualifies on the pole, leads the most laps, and refuses to get out of that race car. Earnhardt is the man. <laughs> he's a tough cat, and he's next in the rearview mirror. Was Talladega the turning point in terms of your chase for the championship? Well, any time you get broke up pretty good in a race car or any, any sport, really, it takes a while to, to recover, and uh, you play hurt for quite a while. And... Uh, it was a setback. Uh, they were periods in that time that we had better days than other, and it was periods that we had really rough days. So I can't blame everything on the Talladega wreck, just Talladega. And uh, the rest of it was just uh, circumstantial. You know, we had to put a backup driver in at uh, Indy, and Watkins Glen was a good race for us, but yet we give up there at the end driver-wise, and uh, just a tough year for us. Any second thoughts after that crash? You don't crash that hard that often. You and Teresa ever look each other in the eye after that and think, boy, how much longer do we want to keep doing this? Racing's part of our life, and uh, we've sort of got a time frame and a time schedule for everything we want to do, and we're not there yet. We've got uh, several years left in racing and uh, to, to win and try to win another championship or several championships, and uh, that's what we're going for. Childress and I have talked it over several times, and. Uh, there's no second guessing it. No, you know, I mean, that's like get, staying in the car at Watkins Glen. Uh, Teresa got a little upset about that because she thought I was overdoing it. And really, I probably was. But still, I wasn't taking any more chance doing that than I was racing at any other point or time in my career. You take that chance every time you get in a race car. You may not second guess each other. Everybody in the world second guesses the guy at the top. For any other driver, second and fourth in two seasons would be great. For you, it brings the critics out of the woodwork. What's wrong with the team? They've lost their focus. They've got too many other things going on. Do you buy any of that? Are you as good a team as you were when well, you were killing them every the week? More you, the more you win, the more you do, the more you accomplish, the more there is to go along with it. There's more people. There's more opportunities, more things to do, more people wanting you to do things, and uh, you just got to gear up and do it. Since Charlotte, I think we've been home a total of four to five days, and, and until after Japan, we won't be home for another day or two three, between there. But in, in all doing all that, there's a lot of good things happening. The racing, for one. Uh, the, the banquets, the, you know, the opportunities to go to Japan and race. Uh, I'm going to London for a little uh, award. It's a pretty exciting deal to be an American driver going to London for an uh, a, a international award, really. But bottom line, three months from now, 1997, starting with a clean slate, is this race team going to be the team to beat for the championship? We're going to be one of the guys to beat. There's a, uh, that's what we pride ourselves in every year is being one of the guys in, in the hunt. And uh, I don't know whether we'll be as strong as we have been in the past because everyone's gotten stronger. Uh, but still, we're going to be there doing our best. And I, ch I tell you, Childress is a, he's phenomenal car owner. He just keeps working and rising to the occasion and to the task and, uh, you know, the challenge comes and we meet it. I feel like we can win another championship and I feel like next year is a good opportunity for us. Well, Earnhardt didn't have a chance to win that championship, that final race in Atlanta, but he certainly let it be known. He was pulling for Terry Labonte. Might be because they started at the same time. Rookies in 1979.
Well, Terry Labonte is one of the Winston Cup heroes from whom we will hear later in the hour. Up next, three guys whose combined efforts produced a total of seven Winston Cup victories in the season just passed. We'll be back with more of the McDonald's NASCAR Winston Cup rearview mirror. Next up in the rearview mirror, Bobby Hamilton. He made his first visit to victory lane in Phoenix this fall in his 167th career start. But even Hamilton knows that NASCAR fans are more excited to see King Richard Petty get his first win as a car owner. And of course, everyone's a Richard Petty fan. I can't think of one person I've ever met that didn't like Richard Petty. And that goes a long way with me driving the race car. So I, I'm just, I'm glad for them to get the car back there. I wanted to be the one to bring the car back to Victory Lane, and I was beginning to wonder if he's going to be able to do it before the season was out, but uh, it feels real good. You know, there can't be many people in this sport who weren't happy to see King Richard get back in Victory Lane, but Benny, what about the guys who didn't win a race? It is, a, is it a complete loss? Is your season a disaster if you don't win? I don't think so. Uh, I, someone like Mark Martin, who won four times in 1995 and did win in 1996, folks, he was right there. He had a chance to win so many times, just couldn't pull it off. But you take someone like Ricky Rudd, now he'd won a race 13 straight years and trying to keep that streak alive, yes, if he hadn't won and kept that streak alive, it would have been a complete loss. How did he know that Ricky Rudd is one of the guys we're about to join in the rear view mirror here as we hear from a man who won a lot and two guys who won late. The guy who won a lot, of course, is Rusty Wallace, five victories in 96, second only to Gordon, 25 wins in four years, second to no one. Well, the championship's been my, on my, my number one goal forever and ever, but I just haven't got close to it. The performance has been tough, definitely been there. I mean, all these wins and running up front and doing this and doing that, but I can't put up with a DNF and then a win, then a DNF, then a win. Those who waited late to win were Ricky Rudd and Bobby Labonte. Ricky has won a race every year since 83. Last season, he won with only one race left. This year, not quite so dramatic. He won with two races left. It's something I think that we're very proud of to have a record like that and there's not too many guys that can claim that type of performance over the years and especially with the different teams and the different cars that I've driven for over the years. But, you know, every year we come out, we want to come out and win every single race on the Winston Cup schedule. Obviously that doesn't happen. So somewhere along the line there's a compromise and we're just really happy that we can win at least a race every year for, for quite some time now. And uh, it was a struggle this year. I was beginning to wonder if it was going to happen. And Bobby made the series finale at all Labonte's show, finally winning on the day his brother claimed the championship, adding a huge Unical bonus for doing so from his fourth pole in seven races, and thus proving that the new in-house engine program is coming along fine. The best thing about it is people said it takes you five years to become a contender. And at first, you know, it looked like that. But those guys, John Wilson, Mark Cronquist, and all the guys in the back, I mean, those guys worked night and day and really turned that thing around to where the program is working and we got confidence in, in it. They've got confidence in us. So, I mean, in, in a full season, we've went 180 degrees. Now, those guys won seven races between them. Jeff Gordon, he visited Victory Lane 10 times this year, more than anybody else. We'll hear from him later. And next, I'm going to sit down with Elder Statesman. Elder Statesman. Terrell Walters. Stay with us as the McDonald's NASCAR Winston Cup rearview mirror continues. Comebacks were a big story in 96. As we take a look in the rearview mirror, Ernie Irvin back for his first full season since 93, and he managed a top 10 finish in the points and wins at Loudon and Richmond. Not bad for a guy who didn't have much of a chance to ever race again. There's not a medical doctor in the world that doesn't think this is some sort of a miracle, but um, I don't really have enough to compare, nothing to compare it to. I'm really excited that, um, that, that God has watched out for me and enabled me to be able to do this again. Jeff Bodine came back from a divorce that last year left him feeling like he didn't want to race anymore. But the owner-driver found his way to victory lane for the first time since 94 with a solid win at Watkins Glen, which was special for Bodine in a lot of ways. The win at Watkins Glen uh, was the result of a lot of hard work, uh, you know, don't give up attitude, and a lot of healing within the team, within myself. We all know that story, I guess, uh, the divorce thing. But Watkins Glen, I think, tells the story of this year. Uh, we, we did win. We won convincing, convincingly. We didn't luck into it. We earned it. There are a couple of guys who've uh, seen a little controversy in their careers. Irvin, of course, with the uh, recent wreck with Dale Earnhardt, and Bodine back when he and Earnhardt used to wreck every week. But I don't think there's a guy that's been more controversial in his career 
than Daryl Waltrip. He came up when you were a hero. What did you think of the guy? Well, I was probably a little jealous of Daryl Waltrip <laughs> because, A, he was a little younger than I was, had a lot more hair than I had, you and I both, as a matter of fact, <laughs> and he was winning a little more races than I was winning, and he also was winning more championships. So I'm probably a little jealous of Daryl Waltrip. Well, from the rearview mirror, we're going to go to the big picture now because guess what? Daryl Waltrip has a new status in the sport. I'm a little curious about how comfortable you are with this uh, new title that I see in one of the magazines, an elder statesman for the sport of Winston Cup racing. Does that sit well with you? Dave, I'm 49 years old. Now, can you be a statesman at 49 years old? I, well, maybe you can because we got a president that's not really all that. I guess he's about the same age and see what kind of job he does. So <laughs> I guess I guess I could be the elder statesman. But you know why people, people, I guess I look old, I don't know, but people put me in that Petty, Allison, Yarborough, Pearson era, and, and they think I'm as old as those guys are. One of the things that comes along with that, though, is, is a perspective that spans ah. that gap. <clears throat> See, that's where the statesman part okay. of it comes. Well, I have perspective. <laughs> <laughs> Two things I got. 2020 hindsight <laughs> and great perspective. <laughs> well, take that perspective and, and maybe uh, look into your crystal ball. Five years down the road, ten years down the road, you're going to be out of the cockpit. We think you're probably going to be a car owner. Yep. Who knows what other roles you might have. But, but beyond that, how big can this thing get? What do we need to keep it moving the right direction? And maybe the spinoff question is, what are the pitfalls we need to look out for? You know, I, I think one thing that we have to really all be concerned about is growth. Growth takes management. When you got a, when, when you got something that's uh, snowballing like this thing is, uh, it's got to be controlled. Uh, back in the old days, it ran itself. We were looking for places to race. We were looking for things to do. We're looking for new ventures. Right now, they're looking for us. Everybody says you got to have a five-year plan. I'd like to sit down with Billy France, Lisa France, Brian France, and ask them what is their five-year plan. That's what I'd like to know, so I could adjust accordingly. Right now, we're just making out schedules and we're adding on races, and it looks great, and this is exciting, and this is it's, it's, this is great. But where where are we going? And I, I ask that question uh, pretty regularly. Where are we going? I can't keep up uh, sponsor-wise. I can't go to my sponsor often enough and say I need more money. Because every time I think I got what I need, NASCAR throws me a curve. Every time I got what I think I need, they change the rules. Uh, body, quarter panels up, quarter panels down, spoiler up, spoiler down, 14 to 1 engines, 15 to 1 engines, no restrictor plate, restrictor plate, sleeves in the motor, no sleeves in the motor. Let me play devil's advocate to that, maybe. Let me take, and the media don't often do this, but let me take NASCAR's side and say, well, now, wait a minute, Daryl. All that may be true, but look where we were and look where we are. I mean, look at your bottom line. Look at all the money. I mean, certainly there's a case to be made that this is one of the true success stories of the 80s or the 90s I agree. in American sport. So are we looking for the balance here, then? Is that is that the bottom line on this, that we've got to... Keep that growth, yep. but manage the growth. We got to catch our breath. I mean, you know, we got people building racetracks now. See, you used to nobody would build a racetrack. Nobody would spend a million, a uh, hundred million dollars, hundred and fifty million dollars to build a racetrack because they knew they couldn't get a date. So they just didn't take. They they would come to NASCAR and say, "If we build it, will you come?" Now they've learned, as in the movie, we build it, they will come. And because of New Hampshire and uh, now Texas and uh, Wilkesboro situation, all, the, all of a sudden everybody says, if we build it, we'll get a date. Uh, look at Homestead, look at Las Vegas, and so on and so forth. This is good. I mean, this is free enterprise. And if, if somebody's got a better mousetrap, then we need to take advantage of it. It's, it's going to get sticky, stickier as we go along. <laughs> and I'm glad to be a part of it. I love it. It's exciting for me. But you asked about, you know, it's bigger and it's better. Sure, I'm, I'm making more, but I'm spending a lot more. And that's the bottom line. When I get done at the end of the year, I say, man, look what I made. Oh, look what I spent. <laughs> and that's, that's, that's the good news, bad news. You were a thorn in the, in the side of those old guys when you came up and you were Jaws, and I get the sense that as you mature in your role as an elder spokesman, 
you're going to continue to be a thorn in their sides, aren't you? Well, I think somebody has to get their attention. And I, trust me, I know this for a fact. You see that little machine right over there? That gets their attention. When you say something to America and the hundred of millions of people that watch that little thing right over there, that gets their attention. Hey, America, <laughs> plan on seeing a lot more of Daryl Waltrip. I'll tell you something else. The big sponsors that drive this thriving sport are attracted by that television camera. It's also the reason that we see those ridiculous, ongoing, never-ending hat exchanges in Victory Lane. But you know what I hate the most? I hate, I hate those sand parized, all sound the same, made for television sound bites. We know we're a strong team. Crew's done a great job. My guys were just trying to do the best job they could. And we ran good all day long, and, uh, you know, our Kell Kellogg Chevy was pretty tough. Oh, we had a real good car. Well, the RC Ford uh, run awesome all day and handled good. The motor ran good. We're real happy with it. You know, the guys are doing a real good job. <laughs> it's always a lot of fun. The interstate cars did a great job. The guys did a great job in the pits all day. Had a great car all day long. The guys did a terrific job in the pits. It's a shame because our Kellogg Chevy was running pretty good. You know, I think the best thing about winning here at Dover is, uh, is, is that DuPont's right in Wilmington up the street. Sterling Marlin continues to see Super Speedway success in his rearview mirror. A win in the spring race at Talladega and a rain-shortened victory in the Pepsi 400 in July. But even with the two victories, Marlin was disappointed. Eighth place in the points, and he has some answers on how Morgan McClure needs to improve. To qualify in the short track program down, maybe we can, you know, come back next year and, uh, you know, get back to top five in points. And, uh, and I sure would like to win a short track race, so uh, we'll see what we do about it. From Sterling, let's go to the story of those frequent rule changes this year in Winston Cup racing. And, Benny, that's a story that actually dates back to the end of last season. The final race in Atlanta in 1995, NASCAR did something they've never done before. They impounded a Ford, a Chevrolet, and a Pontiac, and they took them to the wind tunnel. Didn't, didn't depend on the teams for that information, collected their own information and trying to get those cars equal as they could possibly be. In 1996, then they started playing with spoilers. Aerodance, trying to make the playing field feel as level as they possibly could because they want to promote side-by-side -side racing. Well, it's no surprise that not everyone agreed with all those rule changes. I think this has probably been a record-breaking year as far as rules are concerned. They've been so Mickey Mouse. And that's another aggravating side is we had cars that turned obsolete before they ever rolled out the door to race because of the rule changes. And, it, and it's just a bunch of bull. Well, tell us how you really feel, Bill. I think it's fair to say that individual brand loyalties may have a lot to do with your view of a particular rule change. But however you felt about the rules, the guy who enforces them is Gary Nelson of NASCAR. Remember what a big story it was a few years ago when one of the all-time most, uh, what, innovative Winston Cup crew chiefs crossed the fence and became NASCAR's top cop. Give a listen to his perspective after a couple of years behind the badge. What's neat about this sport and what's, what I think a lot of people miss when they, when they get an overview of what's going on is here's all these guys that are working within the rules and, and making their car just a little bit better than the guy next to them by using their wits or their in ingenuity or their, their knowledge or just hard work. And uh, that still pays off. It's still the guy that's the sharpest or put together the sharpest team and works the hardest usually ends up on top anyway. And, and we check these cars so close every week and, and you know, it's, we're not finding things like we used to. So that tells me that, and we're still looking, so that tells me that the guys that are still winning are doing it by hard work and ingenuity. And, and, and I see little things here and there on the cars that, that I said, boy, that's a good idea, you know, and you know, it's perfectly legal. Well, I'll tell you one thing, Gary Nelson hit that nail right on the head. Rules are always going to be controversial, but the three things he's always trying to do is use wits, ingenuity, and hard work for success. Well, now, wait a minute, Benny. Some people would argue there's a fourth ingredient, the multi-car team. We'll talk about it when we come back. Welcome back to Atlanta Motor Speedway. The McDonald's NASCAR Winston Cup rearview mirror turns its attention to multi-car teams. Two owners fielded three drivers each throughout the campaign. Rick Hendrick won everything in sight. As hard as it is to believe, Jack Roush didn't win anything. The Roush Racing Triumvirate of Mark Martin, Ted Musgrave, and new member Jeff Burton is a gold mine of proven and potential talent. 
Martin, a four-time winner last year, blames off-season rule changes for a huge 96 setback. But his guys regroup, finished the year with a remarkable 15 straight top 10 finishes and never got to victory in lane. There goes that old cliche, if you put yourself in position, the wins take care of themselves. I still believe it's true. It just sometimes it looks like you, you have to wait longer than you're supposed to. Uh, you're right. Uh, we've put ourselves in position over and over and over again. Um, what I hope to see happen is get the wins in 97 that we should have gotten in 96 and get the wins in 97 that we should get in 97 and have a fabulous year. Meanwhile, Martin thinks his new teammate, Jeff Burton, has a great future. He gives me a lot of credit for this or that, and um, I just said that, well, he's, he's smart, you know. <laughs> because, you know, uh, to be honest with you, I've said that he's the next superstar for this division. Well, Burton didn't win this year, but he came close enough to serve notice. With another year of experience under his belt, he'll be tough in 97. We want to win some races. Uh, we put ourselves in position to win some races this year and didn't get it done. So hopefully if that old adage about you got to lose something to win some, we, we're putting that into effect. So I think we, uh, we lost chances of no less than six races that we could have won. But they don't pay you what you could have done or what you should have done. They pay you for what you do. Benny, I still can't believe Jack Roush's three cars could run 93 races. Well, 92 races. Burton didn't qualify at Atlanta. 92 races and not win one. It does seem unbelievable, but they were, they were so close so many times. Mark Martin and Jeff Burton. Ted Musgrave did not have a particularly good year. But you think with the drivers he has, Martin, Musgrave, and Jeff Burton, that victor's around the corner. And he's also got quality crew chiefs. Steve Mill run the operation. That Jimmy Finney is over there. And Buddy Parrott. You know success just has to be somewhere right around that corner. Well, let's talk about the other guys. They sure don't have to wait for success. Hendrick Motorsports looms large in the rearview mirror. Hendrick Motorsports is such a huge success story. The championship last year, first and second in the championship in 96. It's easy to forget that its owner has chased the brass ring of multi-car success for over a decade. Newcomers to the multi-car world should listen closely to Rick Hendrick. It seems that people have dramatically oversimplified this equation and said, okay, I can add another team and get a bunch more test dates, so I'll add another team. Do you kind of laugh up your sleeve a little bit when you see all these people jumping on what looks like a very successful bandwagon? I really do. Matter of fact, I, I told our guys the other day, I said, I'd like to see some of these guys that have one car that are real competitive hurry up and get another one, you know, <laughs> because that can hurt them more than it can help them. I mean, if everyone doesn't believe in it, uh, you know, two, two guys can go out here and get in the same car and can't drive it. I mean, it, you've got to set the car up for the person. So having the test dates, that's not, that's not a lot of benefit there. Um, but the main thing is, if you've got something that works and, and, you know, you try to add another layer to it and they work against each other instead of with each other, then it, it's not going to work. I've had, what, uh, about uh, 10 years of, of not doing so well with it, so we found out what really has to work. And, you know, I, I think the key to the, the success of a multi-car team is chemistry between the crew chief, the driver, even if you've got all the equipment, all the technology, you know, all the resources in the world. If the chemistry isn't there and you don't give it time to build, you're not going to be successful. you got, you got a study in contrast. I mean, Jeff Gordon and Terry Labonte, just a little bit about each one. Well, Jeff's a special person. I mean, his, his values his, and, and his talent. Um, to do what he's done as, as quick as he's done it in this sport and to be as, as at peace with himself and the talent, I don't think, if anybody says that, that Jeff Gordon doesn't have unbelievable talent, then they haven't been around racing very long. When you look at Terry, a lot of, the, a lot of things that, that I look at in a driver or, or I look for in a driver, I look at the, the stats and I go down the, the years they've been racing and what they've done, laps they've led and poles and finishes and so forth. And I watched Terry at Wilkesboro in an unsponsored car be in a lap all by himself, position to win the race and have an engine failure. And then I went back and looked at, his, at what he'd done over the years, and I said, you know, and then he's 38 years, 37 years old. And I said, I thought he was 42, you know. And I met Terry, and when you meet someone and you see the, 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 the intensity in their eyes and the, they, want to, they want the ride, they just, they're just want another chance, you're hungry for another opportunity. Boy, that was a great day in our, in our, our life of our organization when we hired Terry Labonte. 
he's going to be a, a factor for a long, long time because I don't see Terry Labonte, uh, he hadn't received as much as he wants yet. He's still hungry for wins and the lead and for championships. So that's good news for us, bad news for the competition. Next we'll hear from the 1995 NASCAR Winch Cup champion, Jeff Gordon, also won 10 races in 1996. Then just as B follows A, we'll move to the 1996 champion, also from Hendrick Motorsports, the man of the year, Terry Labonte. You know, we just kept coming back and kept coming back and uh, finally wound it up in Atlanta. Looking into the rearview mirror, rookie of the year race was a lock early for Johnny Benson. He still had a pretty good first season. Six top tens, 21st in the points. And as he tells us, the experience mattered more than the award. I think just, just getting in to Winston Cup and, and trying to run the best we can. I mean, we knew the rookie situation, so there's not a whole lot you can do about that. I mean, we would have been pretty mad if we would have lost it. But <laughs> <laughs> well, now let's talk about the 93 Rookie of the Year, 95 champion, the guy with a nickname problem, Jeff Gordon. Okay, he likes Speed Racer, but they didn't like Kid. They didn't like Wonder Boy. Flash doesn't go anywhere. I want to propose a new one, Ketchup. Ketchup, yeah. He, he certainly gave him a head start this year. Trouble in Daytona, trouble in rocking it. But then he started that climb, was along, Till he's back in the lead of the NASCAR Winston Cup points. Yeah, the guy who plays catch-up is next in the rearview mirror. Hey, from where you guys started, Daytona, Rockingham, to where you ended up, is an amazing season. Congratulations. Thank you. It, it's uh, really nothing to be ashamed of at all, I don't think. Uh, this team has done a great job. And, uh, you know, to, to start off the season and get down like we did uh, was, was, you know, really something that, that could have taken a lot of wind out of our sail. But I think it's same time and what it did is it picked us back up and, and took us to the next race and uh, luckily Richmond came came in there Richmond really saved us to go there and win that race just uh, really escalated the, the attitude of the, of the guys and, and myself and said all right hey this thing uh, is just be has just begun we got a long time to catch back up you get all the way to the end to the last race and here you are in that catch-up thing again I mean the oil wasn't even warm and you're two laps down and you got to fight your way back again. You must have been thinking this will never end. Here's my whole season. This exactly. Is just like well, it was. The, the whole season seemed like the, the whole race at Atlanta where, you know, we start off and bang, we get two laps down right off the start and have to come from behind. Then we've got one of the best cars where we can go out there and get two laps back. And uh, now we're up there, you know, battling for the win, leading the race. But then at the end, we come up this short. You know, I mean, that is our whole season right there. <laughs> Is there a moment in the year, maybe a single moment, that you wish you had back? I think the biggest thing that, that I would have changed probably and done differently this year was uh, the, the big wreck at Talladega. Uh, you know, Mark and I were battling for a position, and, and instead of, you know, me being able to just give a little and let him squeeze in there, you know, I pushed it, and, uh, and he pushed it, you know, for the same reasons, and caused a huge wreck and cost us a lot of points. Is the championship the only yardstick. Do you subscribe to that t-shirt philosophy that second is, is the first loser? Can you compare your 96 champion, or your 95 championship team to this team and make an, an evaluation? Did you get better? Did you hold your own? Or, or did you lose some ground? Well, obviously, we got better by winning 10 races uh, and, and still winning a lot of polls, uh, leading uh, over 2,000 laps. I mean, we really uh, ha are a better team. And I think that, you know, we just weren't as consistent as we were in 95. 95, nothing went wrong. I mean, it's like, uh, other than maybe our, our last race at Atlanta, everything went our way when we needed it to fall in place. And this year, 96, it's like when we really needed it to go our way, it didn't. And, you know, that's just the way things work. So you don't have to tear your hair out and say, we won all these races, we won all these polls, we led all these laps, and we didn't get the big prize. You don't have to suffer that. Uh, I'm not going to do that, but I think that's something that's going to really make us work hard over the winter to uh, to really um, learn what, what we can learn from this year and going to 97 pumped up. And, and by running good at Atlanta, that's going to make this team really strong over the winter. You're going to find some time in the off season to have a little fun and kick back? Now the season's over, that's what you do. You, you get away and you relax. Uh, you don't think about what you could have done or, or what you did or didn't do. Um, you just think about, hey, you know, it's over. Uh, I'm happy about the way this year has gone. 
uh, and real happy about what's happening for next year and, and just live it up for a little while. A little while. I do mean a little while. <laughs> well, everything about losing a championship is frustrating and disappointing with one little exception. And that would be if you lose it to your teammate. Terry Labonte is next in the spotlight as the McDonald's NASCAR Winston Cup rearview mirror continues. McDonald's 1996 NASCAR Winston Cup rearview mirror is presented by McDonald's. On the track and in her restaurants, just watch us cook. And in part by Quaker State. Quaker State Motor Oil for longer engine life. Drivers checking their rearview mirrors this season saw a lot of different paint jobs behind them. In honor of the Olympics, the Good Wrench Chevy and Kenny Schrader's Bud Car paid tribute. And speaking of tributes, Bobby Labonte's Chevy was one of those, all dressed up for owner Joe Gibbs' induction into the Football Hall of Fame. Kyle Petty's Pontiac ended up black after Felix Sabatis felt NASCAR fined him too heavily at Charlotte. Black? Well, Felix figured that's how Earnhardt, quote, gets away with all that stuff. The Cartoon Network car went black, too. They did it to celebrate Halloween with Scooby-Doo. I don't know. I guess Fred Flintstone wasn't very scary. Silver was a big rage. Rusty Wallace celebrated an anniversary at Richmond. And Terry Labonte went that way of North Wilkesboro and Martinsville. Actually, that's supposed to be iron, like Iron Man, in honor of breaking the King's consecutive start streak. Terry wasn't finished there. October Charlotte race. Kellogg's introduces the new Honey Crunch Corn Flakes car. Interesting. Terry's only wins, Wilkesboro and Charlotte, were with the special paint jobs. Well, Benny, they sprayed a lot of pretty paint in the uh, in the race shops this year, but now it's time for Labonte to go to New York and paint the town. And you think you'd paint it red, but that's not like Terry Labonte. He's a guy that goes to work every day and gives you his best. And this year, he really gave it 100%. A couple of victories, but seven second-place finishes, almost that many third-place finishes. If you took a picture of Victory Lane when the checkered flag was waved, Labonte was there about 50% of the time. Well, 12 years after that last championship, he is back at the top of the heap. Terry Labonte is in the rearview mirror. I got to tell you, man, that hat looks good on you. <laughs> Congratulations. It, it, thank you. It feels good, too. <laughs> Your head's just the right size. That's right. It, it's so long between the titles. I mean, 84 to 96, people had written you off. A lot of people had written you off. Was there ever a time during that low point when you questioned your own ability to get back to the top of this heap and to be Winston Cup champion again? You know, you, you, yeah, probably so. You probably question your own ability, and, and uh, sometimes you just wonder if you're ever going to get the opportunity to get back with a team that's capable of, of uh, winning races and, and winning a championship. And, and you can go around and, and look at all the teams out there, and, and two-thirds of them will tell you, yeah, we got a chance to win the championship at the beginning of the season. But when it really gets down to it, you can count them, count all of them on one hand. And uh, so I, just, I knew that when I had a chance to join Hendrick Motorsports, that was a great opportunity for me. You're the ice man. You keep all those emotions inside, the sense of humor. We see glimmers of it, but we don't see it very often. Do you ever cut loose? Do you ever holler, scream, go crazy, no. have a ball? Uh-uh. Never? Not in public. No. <laughs> <laughs> we need to hang out with you in private. Yeah. What kind of situation? Are you, are, do you get into situations where you're comfortable and let yourself go? Is there a side of oh, you that you we know, really don't I, see? Yeah. Yeah, I, my wife has has told me this several times. She says you've got everybody fooled pretty bad, <laughs> and I, I'm not uh, probably not near as quiet as I appear, especially around my friends. What a great day that last race in Atlanta must have been I mean, for him. Never mind each of you individually, right. you and your brother. Yeah, but yeah. For your dad. You know, he was very excited at Charlotte last year when Bobby won his first race, and I finished second. That was that was a great night for him over there in, in the World 600. And I think this one here definitely topped that one, so it was pretty exciting. Were there moments during the course of this campaign when you felt like it had slipped away? That oh, sure. Gotten away from yes, you? definitely. Dover, I thought we had uh, uh, lost it at Dover up there. Uh, Darlington, we had an engine uh, burn a piston down there. I thought we'd lost it there. Uh, Martinsville, we had a clutch rod fall off. We patched that back together, came back and finished second in the race. Phoenix, when the crashed in practice, broke my hand. I thought that was for sure it. I was lucky uh, that we had a week off between Phoenix and Atlanta. I was lucky that it wasn't a road course. I'd have really been in trouble on a road course. There wouldn't have been no way to do that. Your timing is pretty good, winning this one when you won it. 
big prize money at the end. That's a big difference from the first championship. Yeah, Tell big, me about there's that. There's like different zeros in there. You know, <laughs> the first championship paid one hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars from R.J. Reynolds, and uh, we all said, "Boy, we hit it right," because it was only a hundred thousand a year before, and uh, now it's one point five. So that's uh, a big difference. You know, I mean, a big difference in prize money, and and uh, it makes it. Uh, makes it exciting, but the bottom line is the money's nice, but you want to be the champion. You, you want the trophy. It's a little different now. I mean, this is a, yeah. this is a very big deal. Are you ready for that? Oh, yeah, I think so, that? yeah. Ready to go get them, do all that media work, all that, all that time away from the car, away from the team. That's got to be as tough as anything there is in, in being with Well, there'll be a lot more demands on your time. Uh, that's, that's part of the deal. You know, you know that going in, so... Uh, It'll, that'll, most of that'll be fun, I think. <laughs> yeah. What about the long-term goals? Do you want to grow old driving race cars, put that consecutive start record clear off the board <clears throat> where nobody will ever... You know, I, th I thought about it, and I'm going to be 40 next week, and uh, I would like to race till I'm 50. That's kind of the number I got set. And I might adjust it a couple of years. And how many championships between now and the big 5-0? <laughs> Well, in 12 more years, let me think of it. Hey, uh, another one would be great. You know, Benny, I'd add just one afterthought to that, and it would apply equally had Jeff Gordon or Terry Labonte won the championship, and that is that the second title is the one that proves the first one was no fluke. Imagine 12 years it took Terry Labonte to prove he was no flash in the pan. 12 years to get the second championship. It's the modern era record for the time between titles. He didn't lose any of his ability during that time. It's just that he's finally back with a team that's as good as he is. That's exactly right. Terry Labonte is not the guy that's going to jump in front of the camera and say how great he is. He's not going to tell you how great he is. He's going to let his actions on the racetrack speak for themselves. And those 12 years, you're exactly right. He just did not have the equipment to win that championship. It is time, Mr. Parsons, to close this television program the way we opened it. With your prediction, you correctly called it for 1996. Are you ready to tell us who will be the 1997 Winston Cup champion. No. <laughs> I love this guy. He's Benny Parsons. I'm Dave Despain. That's the story. It's the McDonald's NASCAR Winston Cup rearview mirror. We hope you enjoyed it. See you next year. So long, everyone.